Christian answer. Did it help? Probably not a ton, right? Sometimes we're conditioned as Christians to say these things and to have these certain phrases that we use that are like an automatic response, like, I'm sensing pain, so I use this phrase to comfort, right? It's a little programming joke for you guys. Did I do good? No. But we have these Christianese responses, right? That's what I call it when we have these pat answers, um, that they're, they're, they're usually based in truth. God is in control. That's true. It's usually based in truth, but we overuse it or we use it all by itself and we don't try to do anything else. We just say, oh, but don't worry. God is in control. And devoid of meaning or emotion, that can leave us kind of worse off than before sometimes, right? We have these sayings like, let go and let God, or when God closes one door, he opens another. Or if God brings you to it, he'll bring you through it. And none of these phrases are bad. I've used some of these phrases too. But when somebody's really hurting and that's all we have for them, do we really mean it? Do we really know that it's true when somebody says that to us, when the world is crashing down around us? Or does it sometimes just leave us feeling like life is too hard and you just can't do it anymore? As if that's the only response that a Christian has for you. But I really don't think that the phrase, God is in control, should be a pat answer. I don't think it's a a phrase that should be used flippantly. And so tonight, I don't want to just tell you that God is in control. I want to show you. I want to really show you through God's word in a story about real people experiencing real pain and real depression with real problems. And I want to show you that God is in control. And so if you guys will, uh, turn in your Bibles to the book of Ruth. And while you're turning there, a little bit of backstory. The story of Ruth is it's a pretty interesting one. Um, it, it happens during the, the time of the Judges, um, which was about a generation or two after um, the conquest in, 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 into uh, the Promised Land. And uh, this time, though, it, it was so quickly after God very evidently worked in the lives of his people, um, you know, bringing them out of Egypt and all of these things, uh, was a dark time for Israel. It was, it was a dark time, and the book of Judges characterizes it um, by saying that uh, multiple times throughout the book by saying that everyone did what they saw fit in their own eyes. And if you read through the book of Judges, what people saw fit in their own eyes ended up in civil war, uh, pagan idol worship, child sacrifice, torture as a community event. There's some pretty gruesome stuff in the book of Judges. God's people weren't in a good place during the time of Ruth. And so it kind of seems like an unlikely time for God to step in uh, to weave his redemptive work. There's no, uh, there's no partings of the Red Sea in the book of, of Ruth. It's people of fairly little consequence in the grand scheme of things. There's no kings or queens or miracles or not even God coming and saying, uh, hey, let me talk to you like I talked to Abraham. Um, the story is really just about some ordinary people. That's part of what makes it compelling, and I think you'll see as, as, as we go through the book that uh, it's relatable because it's, it's a story about normal people that God is working in their lives and working through the pain. And so if you will, read with me in the first chapter, verses 1 through 5 of the book of Ruth. It says, In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land, and a man of Bethlehem and Judah went to sojourn in the country of Moab. He and his wife and his two sons... The name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife was Naomi. And the names of his two sons were Malon and Kilion. They were Epathrites from Bethlehem in Judah. They went into the country of Moab and remained there. But Elimelech, the husband of Naomi, died, and she was left with her two sons. These took Moabite wives, and the name of the one was Orpah, and the name of the other Ruth. They lived there about ten years, and both Malon and Kilion died. So the woman was left without her two sons and her husband. So this is the setting for the story. Naomi's kind of the main character here. Um, (laughs) And it doesn't really go into much detail, but this is like the worst setting and opening to a story ever, right? Naomi is uh, in a foreign land. Her husband is dead, and now both of her sons are dead. And on top of that, she's an old woman. Basically, Naomi's life is shattered. It's in pieces. Um, And I think when we read this passage, we 
We don't really dwell on this too much because it's just a couple short verses where it even talks about this. Uh, but Naomi is, is crushed. There's, there's really nothing left for her, and that's even what she says. Literally, things could not be worse for her. And so we move into the story, and, and uh, we're going to kind of skim through some of this, but um, Naomi decides, she says, well, you know, I'm just going to go back to my homeland. There's nothing left here for me. Uh, basically, all this, all this land is, 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 is trouble for me. So she's like, all right, I'm going back to my homeland, going back to Bethlehem. And Ruth and Orpah, who were her daughters-in-law, uh, they both try to follow her. And so they're trying to follow her, and they're like, let us come with you. And she's resisting. She's pushing back. She's saying, no, don't come with me. Um, but Ruth kind of persists. And obviously, we wouldn't have the book of Ruth if she didn't, right? But Ruth persists. And we'll just read this section here, verses 12 through 18, and then talk about it a little bit. So Naomi says, turn back, my daughters. Go your way, for I am too old to have a husband. If I should say I have hope, even if I should have a husband this night and should bear sons, would you therefore wait till they were grown? Would you therefore refrain from marrying? No, my daughters, for it is exceedingly bitter for me, for your sake, that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. And they lifted up their voices and wept again, and Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. And she said, see, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, do not urge me to leave you or... Or to return from following you. For where you go, I will go, and where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there will I be buried. May the Lord do to me more and also if anything but death parts me from you. And when Naomi saw that she was determined to go with her, she said, No more. So this is our first point of the sermon is that God helps us through other people. God helps us through other people. But here, here's the scenario, and I think it's a pretty relatable one. Naomi has lost everything. Probably most of us in the room have not lost everything in the same way that Naomi has. But Naomi has truly lost everything, and she's angry, and she's bitter. She says, the Lord's hand has gone out um, against me. There's nothing left for me. I'm just going to go back. Please don't even follow me. Like She's basically saying, I'm worthless. Like I offer you nothing. Ruth and Orpah, go back to your homeland. Make a life for yourself, is what Naomi's saying. And I think sometimes we feel like this too, even if we haven't lost as much as Naomi. But it doesn't mean that you can't experience real pain but I think that we can relate a little bit, right? I would imagine everybody's probably seen this play out in their own lives or in the lives of somebody else. When the world's crashing down around you and, and you're looking at God and you're like, God, where are you? Do you even care? Are you going to show up at all? And you begin pushing away people around you because you're bitter and you're angry and you don't see God working. And so you're pushing away those that want to help you. Maybe you've been pushed away. Maybe you've been the one pushing people away before. Maybe you were bitter like Naomi. In verse 20, she says, uh, she comes to the people in Bethlehem and she says, do not call me Naomi, call me Mara, for the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. Uh, Mara means bitter. She's basically just like, hey, this is my life, bitter. God hates me. He's destroyed me and I'm bitter, so call me that. This is my life now. Sometimes I think in the midst of deep pain, it's easy to forget that God's provision may come through the help of other people. You see, Naomi tried to shut out her daughters-in-law, Ruth and Orpah, but Ruth stayed by her side, right? Ruth clung to her. And I think it's quite obvious that God was working through Ruth to stay by Naomi, because Ruth very actively goes on throughout the rest of this story to very actively and practically provide uh, for Naomi, to do things that Naomi was probably too old to do, going and gleaning in the fields and, and bringing food back for Naomi. I mean, Ruth literally did everything and sacrificed her whole life to be with Naomi. But before we get to that part, I, I want to talk about the, the one big thing that Naomi missed. This is, this is where she really missed it, in verse 21. They come back, and they're talking to the people of Bethlehem, and Naomi says, I went away full, and the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi when the Lord has testified against me, and the Almighty has brought calamity upon me? You guys catch that? She says, I went away full, and I came back empty. Who's probably standing right next to her? Probably Ruth. Probably Ruth is standing right next to her while she says, I went away full, and I came back 
empty. And we're not ripping on Naomi, but I think this is where she missed it. This is where she missed that God was trying to help her through Ruth. And now granted, God didn't part the Red Sea to grant Naomi safe travel back to Bethlehem. He didn't come down and say, here's a sign that I will restore your life or anything like that. But I think that this is where we miss God in action too in our lives. When everything's going wrong and we, we, we tend to look at God and say, well, God, <laughs> I've been pretty faithful to you, so where's the help? I see you helping these people in the Bible. What, what's the difference? Do you care about me? And we're looking for sometimes the wrong things. We're angry with God at his seemingly lack of attention or help, but we're not looking at the people around us that God has maybe put in our lives to help us. Chapter two is where the story um, kind of begins to, I guess what I would call, I don't know a better way to say it, but, but what I would call it begins to stack with providence. So God's providence is all over in this story. In verse three of chapter two, read it with me. It says, um, and, and, and Ruth goes out into the fields and says, so she set out and went and gleaned in the field after the reapers. And she happened to come to the part of the field belonging to Boaz, who is part of the clan of Elimelech. Um, now, this was written this way. She happened to come to the field. Uh, not to say that it was just pure coincidence, but to show that it wasn't by any human hands. It wasn't Ruth that was like, all right, probably Boaz would be the best. Or it wasn't Naomi that was like doing her research with the townsfolk and like, okay, Boaz's field is a good field. No, it's meant to show that nobody had their hand in this but God. God was directing this encounter. And so then she, she goes to the field of Boaz, and, and we get to see this really cool encounter where not only is Ruth encouraging Naomi, but now God sends somebody to encourage and help Ruth. So Ruth goes to the fields to glean um, from what is behind the reapers, and we won't go into this a ton, but basically it was a way that God had set up for the Israelites um, as part of their society that when you're going through the fields and you're collecting the grain and stuff, if it fell to the ground, you would leave it for somebody who was poor or needy, and they could come behind it and pick it up. And so it was, it was almost like a welfare system that God had set up to help provide for people when they were either poor or during hard times. Um, so kind of a cool thing. But then let's jump into verse 8 and read through 17. That's the context. Um, so Ruth is there, and then we see in verse 8, it says, Then Boaz said to Ruth, Now listen, my daughter, do not go to glean in another field or leave this one, but keep close to my young women. Let your eyes be on the field that they are reaping and go after them. Have I not charged the young men not to touch you? And when you are thirsty, go to the vessels and drink what the young men have drawn. Then she fell on her face, bowing to the ground, and said to him, why have I found favor in your eyes that you should take notice of me since I am a foreigner? But Boaz answered her, All that you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband has been fully told to me, how you left your father and mother and your native land and came to the people, to a people that you did not know before. The Lord repay you for what you have done, and a full reward be given you by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. Then she said, I have found favor in your eyes, my Lord, for you have comforted me and spoke kindly to your servant, though I am not one of your servants. And at mealtime, Boaz said to her, come here and eat some bread and dip your morsel in the wine. So she sat beside the reapers and he passed to her roasted grain and she ate until she was satisfied and she had some left over. When she rose to glean, Boaz instructed his young men saying, let her glean even among the sheaves and do not reproach her. And also pull out some from the bundles for her and leave it for her to glean and do not rebuke her. So she gleaned in the field until evening and then she beat out what she had gleaned and it was about an ephah of barley. So the first thing I want us to notice, and an ephah of barley, I don't know the exact measurement, but it's like, it's like a big sack. It's way more than she would have gotten normally. And Boaz made sure to do that for her. Um, but the first thing I want us to notice is what Boaz says in verse 12 says, the Lord repay you for what you have done, and a full reward be given you by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. So Boaz sees the, the situation where Ruth is taking care of Naomi. She's sacrificing everything to do so. And so Boaz, is, he comes to Ruth, and he's like, hey, you know, stay in my field. You know, uh, like, I, I've heard what you've done. May God bless you. But he doesn't just end there. He doesn't just say, hey, may God bless you for what you've done. Then he actually does it, Right? Boaz then actually goes to his reapers and he says, hey, 
throw some extra on the ground for her. Make sure she's well treated. Make sure she has water in the heat of the day. Make sure she is able to come and eat with us at mealtime. Boaz literally actually is the hands and feet of God in this scenario. So that's just kind of a tidbit, nothing really to do with our point. Um, <laughs> but it, the fact is, he says, may God bless you, and then he blesses her because God helps us through other people. The next thing I want us to notice about this section is how Boaz's kindness was such a great encouragement to Ruth. In verse 13, it says, uh, Ruth says, Then she said, I have found favor in your eyes, my Lord, for you have comforted me and spoken kindly to your servant, though I am not one of your servants. So Boaz's actions had greatly comforted Ruth. I mean, this may have been a hard time for Ruth, right? Especially if Naomi's attitude was, I went away full and I came back empty, right? And again, not ripping on Naomi. She was probably really depressed. But Ruth is helping her and giving of herself daily, daily. And finally, somebody notices and recognizes and says, hey, let me help you out a little bit. And that's Boaz, because God helps us through other people. Then in verse 20, uh, Ruth goes back to Naomi with the ephah of barley. And and it says, and Naomi said to her daughter-in-law, may he be blessed by the Lord, whose kindness has not forsaken the living or the dead. Naomi also said to her, the man is a close relative of ours, one of our redeemers. This is that kind of stacked level of providence here. Ruth is helping Naomi, and then Boaz is sent by God to help Ruth, who is in turn still helping Naomi. And Boaz's actions not only encouraged Ruth, but then also encouraged Naomi because God helps us through other people. Um, We've been reading a, a, a book about discipleship um, with the officers. And there's a a quote that really stuck out to me. It's written by Mark Dever, and it's just called Discipleship. Um, But it says, Christianity is not for loners or individualists. It's for people traveling down the narrow path that leads to life. You must follow and you must lead. You must love and be loved. And we love others best by helping them to follow Jesus down the pathway of life. And what I find compelling about this quote is that we were not designed to go through life alone. It's not part of God's plan for us to endure hardship alone. And that's why God helps us through other people. You see, sometimes we're, we're, we're looking for God's visible voice or action. But we forget that as believers, when we have the Holy Spirit inside of us, and we're experiencing some pain, and another believer comes and helps us, and they have the Holy Spirit inside of them, that is literally God helping us through someone else. And so here's kind of the, the, the takeaway for this section is that when calamity strikes, when we're angry with God, when everything's falling apart in our lives, I think we need to start looking for the right things when we go to God and say, where are you? When we go to God and we say, are you going to help me at all? Are you going to give me anything? I think we need to start looking for the right things. Instead of maybe looking for the Red Sea to part or the fleece on the ground from Gideon or some other crazy thing that we kind of have in our minds of like how God's going to help us, we need to start looking to a community of believers that God has sent to us that are also filled with his spirit. God has given us a community of believers to help us through our pain because God helps us through other people. Moving along in the story, we're going to kind of skip uh, chapter 3 and most of chapter 4, but um, the brief explanation is that um, there was this custom back in, uh, in Old Testament times. Again, it was a thing that God set up uh, to make sure that people were taken care of. It was, a, it was meant to uh, help people that were in need, and it, it was this idea of a kinsman redeemer, right? It said Boaz was a kinsman redeemer, so what is that? Um, basically, the long or the short answer of it is that uh, if a man would die and he left behind a widow, either children or childrenless, um, a near relative would then take her in and provide for her. If she didn't have any kids, kids, typically he would marry her, and then her kids would carry on the, uh, the name of the, the deceased father. And it was a way of God making sure there was systems set up in his, in his community of people that would care for uh, the needy and the destitute, widows, right? Um, and so uh, this happens with, uh, with Ruth and Boaz. They find out he's the, um, he's the kinsman redeemer. And so Boaz marries Ruth, and it's this beautiful picture that's really a lot like uh, Jesus and us, right? R- Ruth comes to Boaz with 
really nothing, right? I mean, she's a foreigner. She's a widower. Uh, nothing really to offer. She's poor. Um, her grandmother her, or her mother-in-law kind of comes with her as a package deal. In the grand scheme of things, she's not really offering much. But Boaz is a righteous man, and he follows God's law, and he marries her and brings her in and provides for both of them. Um, and it's a lot like how we come to Christ. We don't offer anything to Jesus in the equation of our salvation. We come to Jesus just as much foreigners as Ruth, separated from God by our sin, not adding anything to God because he doesn't need anything from us. And yet he brings us in and adopts us as sons and daughters, bringing us into the family of God. And so it's this really cool picture kind of acted out here in this story. Um, but, but our second point is really in, in the end of chapter 4, and, and our point is that God brings good out of bad. That might be another kind of Christianese saying for you guys, right? Uh, you may have heard that one before. But God brings good out of bad, and let me show you how. Consider the differences as we read through verses 13 through 16. So Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife, and he went into her, and the Lord gave her conception, and she bore a son. Then the women, woman said to Naomi, Blessed be the Lord, who has not left you this day without a redeemer, and may his name be renowned in Israel. He shall be to you a restorer of life and a nourisher of your old age. For your daughter-in-law, who loves you, who is more to you than seven sons, has given birth to him. Then Naomi took the child and laid him on her lap and became his nurse. And the women of the neighborhood gave him a name, saying, A son has been born to Naomi. They named him Obed. He was the father of Jesse, the father of David. Notice how God brought good out of bad. Notice the complete difference from the beginning to the end. And nobody's saying that Naomi's just totally forgotten about what happened in Moab. Nobody's saying that there aren't some lingering pains uh, from losing her husband and, and her her two sons, somebody's saying that. You see how God worked through the pain and, and brought redemption into her life, gave her Ruth, brought Boaz to both of them, and then gave her a grandson through Ruth. It's a complete reversal of the story. Verse 13 is what God did for, for Ruth. So Boaz took Ruth and she became his wife and he went into her and the Lord gave her conception and she bore a son. Sometimes we forget that Ruth was hurting too, Right? So Naomi lost everything, but Ruth also lost her husband, her brother-in-law, and her father-in-law. And I don't know if you guys caught this, but in the beginning of the first five verses, um, Ruth had been married to her previous husband 10 years and had no children. So it's implied that she wasn't able to. So not only did God bring her Boaz, but he also gave her a son. Pretty cool. And then verses 14 through 16 is what God did for Naomi. Blessed be the Lord who has not left you this day without a redeemer, and may his name be renowned in Israel. He shall be to you a restorer of life and a nourisher of your old age. For your daughter-in-law who loves you, who is more to you than seven sons, has given birth to him. Then Naomi took the child and laid him on her lap and became his nurse. So we see this picture at the end of the story of maybe kind of like a grandma-like looking Naomi holding her grandson and, like, not having to worry about where her next meal comes from. What a reversal in the story. So I want to I take just a moment to notice the beginning to end back and forth. So in the beginning, Ruth and Naomi have no one to provide for them. The end, Boaz marries Ruth and provides for them both. Naomi has no child to carry on the family name. Naomi has a grandchild through Ruth to carry on the family name, which, by the way, the family name that leads to King David, the great King David, and then, of course, the connection to the lineage of Christ. Uh, King David is in the lineage of Christ. So not only was this just a son to carry on the family name, but this was a son that would be part of the lineage of Jesus, the lineage of the Messiah. Naomi and Ruth are separated from God in the country of Moab. Ruth is grafted into the salvific covenant of God, and Naomi is reborn into the blessings of God. Naomi's sons are married to Moabite women. Naomi's grandson is named Obed, which means servant of God, and is the grandfather of King David in the lineage of the Messiah. God brings good out of bad. How many of you guys have heard of uh, Francis Chan? 
Did you guys know that his father passed away when he was 13 years old? How many of you guys have heard of C.S. Lewis? Like one of the greatest theologians ever. Um, His mother and brother and father all died at age 10. He was sent to a boarding school. And then in World War I, he fought and was wounded and his best friend died. Some pain right there. Elizabeth Elliot. She was the wife of, of uh, well, Mr. Elliot. I don't know. What was his name? <laughs> anyway, she was, she, was, she was a missionary with her husband. And, and does nobody know his name? Well, Jim. Jim Elliot. There you go. Okay, so she's, she was a missionary with Jim, her husband. And they were raising their 10-month-old daughter. And Jim goes to contact this, this tribe in South America, and he's speared to death. But she didn't just leave. Elizabeth Elliot then went back to that exact same tribe with those exact same people and brought to them the gospel. And they actually were able to believe it and accept it because of the love that they saw in her actually caring about them still and their salvation. Ravi Zacharias. How many of you guys heard of him? Ravi Zacharias tried to commit suicide at age 17 because, get this, in New Delhi, or in Delhi, India, He was second in his high school placement scores. Because he was second place, that brought shame to his family. And he tried to commit suicide. He ended up in the hospital. Corey Ten Boom. Corey Ten Boom was uh, taken to a concentration camp as a young child. And, uh, well, not a young child, but as a teenager. And her whole family died. She was the only one to survive the concentration camps. But while she was there, and then even after, she preached the gospel to literally thousands of people. And so this is, this is the point that I'm, I'm trying to make. Why is it that some of the greatest and most revered men and women in Christian history, I mean, it, all of these people are Christian household names, right? Like, you know these people, you see the impact that they have, you see how God has used them. Why is it that all of them, or a lot of them, have experienced some of the worst tragedies and pains that life has to offer? I'm not saying that you have to experience hardship to be effective for the gospel by any means. But the point I want us to be able to see here is that God brings good out of bad. God is able to bring And so I think our application is found in this verse right here. Knowing that God brings good out of bad, we have to be willing to be a part of God's plan, even through our pain and suffering. In the same way that Paul says in Corinthians, we share with other people's suffering because we've been comforted by Christ in our suffering. And so we share in others' suffering. And we have to trust that in the same way that God brought good out of bad in the life of Naomi, and Ruth, C.S. Lewis, Elizabeth Elliot, all of these other ones, and even your lives as well, for many of you, God is working to bring the good out of the bad in our lives. And so the biggest takeaway that I want us to have from the sermon is simply getting a glimpse into what God sees when we have pain in our lives, when we experience these horrible things in life. I don't know what your pain is, but I know that you've experienced pain. To some degree, some of us far more than others, but There's pain in this life. There's death. There's bad things. There's sin. There's our sin. You may never have read the story of Ruth and Naomi before tonight, but you could you could uh, now you could after knowing the story you could read through it again, and you wouldn't even be a little bit surprised that Naomi and Ruth are like the ending of it, right? You wouldn't even be a little bit surprised that at the end, Naomi and Ruth were restored and all these good things happened to them and God weaved his plan through the pain and, and, and brought redemption to them, right? You wouldn't even be a little bit surprised. And here's the nice thing about God and his foreknowledge, his knowledge of what's going to happen is he's not surprised either. 
In the same way that we could almost envision ourselves saying, uh, you know, if we could go back to the time of Naomi and Ruth when, when they're in the midst of it, right? In the thick of it. And we would, we would come alongside them. We might say, Naomi, don't give up. God might not be parting the clouds or the Red Sea, but, but he is working through the people around you. And he's helping you through the people over, around you. I promise it's gonna get better because God is in control. And if we could talk to Ruth, we might say, Ruth, persevere. God has a plan for your life. I know it's hard to believe right now, but God can bring good out of bad because God is in control. Hang on, hang in there, Ruth. You see, this is the way that God looks at our lives. 